live um, a little bit early, but I thought this way we can just make sure that everything is working. So let's see if it's going to go through. And um, it's there we go. Let's see. I think, yes, I'm live now. Okay, so we are a bit early, which just give me one or two moments to just get ready and to give everyone time to to come up. Um, this is a it's it's at least eight weeks. It's the seven letters to the seven churches, but I do try and unpack a little bit wider and um, sort of show some other things around it, so we get a, a bigger perspective of of what it's what it's all about. Um, I am a little bit early, I think two minutes early, so I'm just going to give people time to come on and get myself ready in the meantime. But at least now, if you are connecting and you can see me, you know you've got the right place. Hi, Caroline. Lovely to see you. So I can see the screen here because I've positioned it a bit closer. So as long as there are not too many things coming through at the same time, I might be able to answer questions on the screen. Otherwise, on the WhatsApp group, you can ask questions there and I will watch from there as well. Sandy's on. Hi, Sandy. Yay. And Annie, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'm so excited to be connecting. I wish I could see you. I can see a little picture of you. That's all I can see. <laughs> oh, yay. Caroline, <laughs> you're laughing at me. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know who else has come on. Let's see. No, that's the wrong one. Let's see if there's one over here. There we go. Oh, good. Oh, good. So it's all good. I hope it's not on the main Facebook. I just want it to be on, on the ministry page. So I'm really trusting it's only on the ministry page. Anyway, for you guys that are on already, you can open um, your Bible to Matthew 13 and to Revelations 1. Just sort of have those two places ready and have a little notebook ready. And then um, just waiting for one. I, I won't start until it is um, 7 o'clock because that's when we said we were going to start. But I just wanted to test it for myself and to make sure that you guys have connected. Okay, so everything seems to be all systems go. Yay, so glad. I'm quite nervous, you guys. I always find it less daunting just to just to preach and I don't know who's staring at me, but but it's, I feel like, like in, it's in a small home cell, you know, when everyone's very close. <laughs> and you're looking up each other's nostrils. That's what I'm feeling like right now. <laughs> oh, I forget people are going to watch this later as well. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's seven o'clock. Right. Well, I think we're going to start. And um, trust the others will get on and find their way here. Um, Yay. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to start by praying, just opening in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this incredible privilege that we have of being able to communicate with each other and to connect with each other across the airwaves like we're doing now. It's just absolutely amazing to be able to do this and to be able to be equipped and to learn. Um, Father, how amazing you are. You just, you just use everything to your good and to your glory. I want to ask you for such an anointing tonight, especially on my ability to teach. Father God, your word says that your word will never return void. So whatever is absolutely anointed and landed on by the Holy Spirit, that that will not return void, that that will become part of who we are spiritually and grow and keep on growing and becoming mighty and powerful. And I want to thank you, Father, for the spirit of revelation and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of wisdom. I want to thank you for the seven spirits before the throne to brood over us, that we can receive wisdom and that we can grow and that you will show us things we've never seen and that we will even, as I'm teaching tonight, see things I haven't seen before under the anointing of your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this privilege that we have to learn more about you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, it's wonderful to be with you tonight. You know, everything that I've ever taught, I taught because I wanted to know more. So I would find something I was interested in knowing more about, and I would research it and study it. And then after I'd found the facts I'd wanted, I would, um, I would teach it. And so most of the things I've taught in my life were, was because I was looking for answers myself. But I woke up one morning, and the Holy Spirit woke me up. And as I woke up, I felt him say to me, teach the seven letters to the seven churches. Now, that was amazing. I said, sure, I'll do that because I'm the sort of person that if the Holy Spirit says do it, I do it before I've thought about it. I say, yeah, I'll do that. And then I think about it afterwards and I go, oh, flip, what does that mean? But anyway, so I um, didn't even know where to find the seven letters to the seven churches. So I did a bit of investigation and I discovered that it was the first three chapters of Revelation. And so that was amazing. Thank you, Linda. So that was amazing um, that I found it. And I said to my husband, God's spoken to me. And he's told me to teach the seven letters to the seven churches. So it's one Sunday when you're free. Because usually I would tell him I had a topic. And then he would fit me in a Sunday or two later so that I could preach it to the church. So I said, so when you're ready, um, I'll be teaching on that. He said, yeah, that's fine. Well, friends, it took me two years, two years of researching and two years of digging and finding answers. Now, we are talking about 20 years ago when Google wasn't what it is today, where things weren't as easily available to research and to find answers as they are today, where I didn't have piles and piles and piles and piles of concordances to dig into to find things. So it took me two years of looking and studying and praying and asking God to reveal things for me to be able to find what it was that he wanted me to have. Um, Okay, so there's a few people asking for notes. Sorry, but the notes will have to come after the teaching. All right, so so I, I started researching it, and the more I researched it, the more I discovered what an incredibly incredible topic it is, because do you understand something? This was Jesus teaching John. It's the words of Jesus himself, and it's just so powerful. So I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed doing the research, and I thoroughly enjoyed digging in and finding the answers. And so, um, so I just want to tell you that everything about Revelations is it's a prophetic book. It is full of parables, full of patterns, and full of symbolism. And so for us to be able to understand the patterns and the parables and the symbolism, and I don't think anybody understands it fully. I think a lot of people have some of it. You know, the Bible says we all have, we all know in part, but when we put our parts together, we get a far bigger picture. So I want to say to you, I'm bringing you a part. I'm bringing you the part that I've got to give to you. You must probably discover more as you go along, and I'd love you to do that. But I'd love to just give you enough to make you hungry, to make you want to know more, and to make you know how to dig and how to find more answers. And there's so much more available today in between being told it's fake news and true news. <laughs> but there's so much more available for us to find. Okay, so I think I'm going to start off by saying this. Who is John? Because Revelations was written by John. So let me discuss a little bit with you about who John is. Well, the first thing I want you to know, and if you do have a manual, it will be on your page one of the manual. John wrote Revelations, and he also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he wrote John, the, 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 um, the Gospel of John. Now, he was one of Jesus' disciples. He was the son of Zebedee. His brother was James. And James was the first one to be killed. When Peter and James were arrested, and they beheaded James, and they were going uh, to kill Peter next, and that's when everybody prayed and Peter was set free. So James was the first um, disciple, the apostle, to be martyred just after um, Judas had committed suicide. Okay, and then we see that he was one of the first apostles. In Matthew 10, 2, it tells us he was one of the first. He was also believed to be the youngest disciple. His mom was, her name was Salome. And according to history, Salome was Joseph's cousin. Oh, sister. Salome was Joseph's sister, which means that John and James and Jesus were cousins. And so they'd grown up together. You know, they lived in a small town. Um, it, they all grew up together. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. On his mother's side, remember, he was, the, he was the, the, the son of Elizabeth, who was Mary's sister. And this, James and John, were on the father's side, the mother being Salome, and the father being Zebedee, 
and the uncle was Joseph, Jesus' father. So they were family. They grew up together. They knew each other. There was an incredible relationship. I mean, anybody that knows Eastern families knows how close those families are. So they were very close. Um, Salome was also one of the women who came to lay out the body of Jesus in Mark 12, in Mark 6, verse 1. Now, Jesus had, had separated three disciples to himself, which were closer to him than the others. And that was Peter, James, and John. So it was his two cousins and Peter. And we see that they, the three of them had been business partners before they became disciples. And Jesus had called them from their fishing boats to come and follow him. They had, he had drawn them closer to himself in Matthew 17, Matthew 26, and Luke 8. We see him being drawn closer. They witnessed the transfiguration with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. They were at Gethsemane with Jesus just before he was going to be crucified. Um, Jesus told John to look after his mom. He also said to James and John, the two of you are going to suffer like I did. So he prepared them that they would. And remember, it was, it was their mom that came and said, can they sit in the left and the right? And he said, you don't know what you're asking of me. So, and when you understand that they were cousins, then you can understand why she might have thought she could have asked that favor from Jesus. Anyway, and he was the only disciple that was at the foot of the cross. The others all fled, but he was with Jesus. And um, he stood there, and Jesus asked him to look after his mother after he died. He wrote John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, as I told you, and he wrote Revelations. Now, when did he write Revelation? All the disciples were martyred, every one of them. Judas committed suicide. And the others all went into different directions. Some went into India. I think Thomas went to India. I think Matthew went into Ethiopia. Uh, one of them went into Russia. They all went into all over the place to go and, and, and to evangelize and to start the, to carry on with the kingdom of heaven and to establish the kingdom of heaven. And all of them, one way or another, were persecuted. We know that Paul was was killed. Peter was crucified upside down. They were all either they were either brutally killed or they were stoned or they were uh, crucified or they had their heads cut off, or they were stabbed, or somewhere they all were killed. And John was boiled in oil, but he never died. And so because he never died, because he, he survived the oil boiling, they sent him to Patmos in exile. And he was on the Isle of Patmos, having these incredible times in the presence of God, when he had the experience and the encounter that led to him writing Revelations. Now, he was also the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, I really want you to get to know why John is so important. Because he was the youngest. He was a cousin. He was the one that always would draw close to Jesus and become go and lie on his chest. He, has, he was an incredibly passionate guy. He, he had this incredible heart for Jesus and for what they were doing. He was the one standing next to Mary, comforting her when everything was happening. So we started understanding the heart of the man. And then he survived the boiling. My friends, I want to tell you now that the persecution that they went through for the sake of the gospel is really incredible. And I also want to say this to you, that um, as I'm unfolding the story of the seven letters to the seven churches, I want you to know that we, you might look at the way you've understood the gospel in a new way when you start seeing something of the unpacking. And I read, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> mm. and I really pray that you do. I really pray that you see it with new eyes, because I did. After I studied this, I saw it completely differently, and I had a whole new perspective on what following Jesus meant and what dying for the sake of the gospel meant. Okay, so he then lands on Patmos. He has this incredible encounter. Two years after he was exiled there, the emperor died and he was set free. And he then went back and history tells us that he became the head of the church in Ephesus. And he stayed there running the church in Ephesus until AD 103 when he was 101 years old. Isn't that amazing? So he stayed there, he ran the church so everything that you read about the letter to Ephesus, he was the, the, the head of the, the, the guy that ran Ephesus, that was the pastor, the leader, the bishop of Ephesus. And at the end of Ephesus, at his death, 
it was the end of the first church era. So it's really important to have a little bit of history of who John was. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about some other things. Tonight's an introduction. I'm not going to get into the actual letters yet. I'm going to give you some introduction and, and teach you around it so you've got a bigger perspective of seeing things. The first thing I want you to see is that seven is mentioned often. Now, seven prophetically is a number of completeness, wholeness, and fullness. So when something is described in sevens, it means the complete of it. That's why the seven spirits before the throne, being the Holy Spirit, is the complete Holy Spirit with the seven different aspects of who he is and what he does. So it's mentioned many times through this word. And so I want you to know that every time it's mentioned, it, it talks about the whole, the complete. It's the perfect number of God, the completed number of God. God created the week and, and six days on the seventh day he rested. So it is the fullness of, Everything's done to the point of rest. Okay. Now, you'll also see that at the end of every letter, it says, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So it says it seven times. Wholeness, fullness, completion. Something really important about that. Well, there's only two other times that that is said again, if you have ears, hear. So we know in the Word of God, Everything is confirmed through two or three witnesses. So you never ever take one scripture to mean anything. You always tie it up with two or three other scriptures. That's how you get the full meaning of everything that we need to know. That's why I so often talk about what does it mean to use the keys of heaven because you look back and see how they were described to be used in other places. So when we look at the seven letters and it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. And it's only mentioned two other times in the Bible. And that is in Matthew 13, where it's talking about establishing the kingdom of God. Then we have to know that there is something here that we've got to connect together. And so John would have understood how to connect it together because he walked with Jesus. He understood that when Jesus spoke about something, spoke about it again, there was a connection in it. So I want us for a minute, and I'm going to start here. Jesus says, listen with your spiritual ears and understanding. Take very seriously what I'm saying to you, as it has serious consequences. That's what it means when he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So I want you just to have for a minute, look at Matthew 13. And that's why I asked you to read it, so that you could be prepared for it. And Matthew 13 is the seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. Remember, seven, completeness, wholeness. And now I'm going to start right here, and I'm going to tell you this, that there are many mysteries in the Bible. And you'll find that as you tie things together, you discover a whole other thing that starts developing. As you look in your manual at page 146, which you don't have to look at now, but you can look at later, I have put together a table called the Table of the Sevens. And as you see things being presented in the Word, in the order that they are presented in the Word, they will link up with other times where things were put into order of sevens. So it's really important to see that seven letters to the seven churches, they are in a specific order. They have a very definite meaning in the order that, they, that they're listed in. Seven parables, the order of the seven parables is very important, and you can link it to the order of the seven letters to the seven churches. And there are many others that can be linked like that, and we will look at it over the period of time. Now, as we read this, I'm going to start by reading the end of, of um, Ma um, Matthew 12, 50. And Matthew 12, 50, Jesus' mom and brothers have just come to him, and he was ministering, and they called him away and said, come with us. And he said, no. And he went on to say this, who is my mother and who is my brothers? Pointing at his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and my brothers. In that statement, Jesus said, whoever does the will of my father is my family. He was telling us, even though he had a physical family, he was establishing a kingdom family. Then it said later on the same day, so out of that, establishing kingdom family, he goes on to talk about the seven parables about the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to have a look at them, and I want you to see what they mean. So the first one, it says, um, he talks about the farmer. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds, or the King James says the fowls, came and ate it up. 
Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much so a soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew and the seed fell in good, um, which grew and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty and thirty times that which was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. So, the first parable talks about the seed which comes from God, the truth, the word of God, falling on the condition of the soil, which is our hearts. And it goes on there to say that what threw on the, was thrown on the path, the enemy came to steal. You see, my friends, hard hearts can't receive the truth of God. And when, they, when it falls on a hardened heart, it just gets stolen by the enemy and it doesn't grow at all. Then it said the rocky places. Now, these are the places where people are shallow, they're immature, and they have no roots. So it falls, it grows, there's, there's incredible excitement and delight, and you see this enthusiasm, but it doesn't take long, and suddenly it just dwindles away, and those seeds die because they have no foundation, they have no roots. The Bible says we're, not, we're to make disciples of people, not just give them seed. The next one uh, throws in the thorny areas where trouble and persecution comes, they fall away. Now that's really important for me to mention tonight because we're in troubled times and we could be entering into greater persecution. Some people already are in great persecution. This is the time where we see who the church of God really is. This is the time that those that have got deep roots will stand in perseverance. But those who haven't get offended, they blame God, they blame other people, and they just fall away. Because trouble and persecution has caused them, like thorns, to be choked. And then it said the good seed falls in good soil. And that produces. So what is that parable about? The parable is about when the word of God comes, the condition of the soul of the person is going to decide whether that, that, that word is going to take root and change their life or not. So he's talking about the very beginning of the kingdom of heaven. Parable number one will align with the book of Ephesians, the first letter to the first church. It's about what circumstances can do to a Christian. Now, as you look at that parable, you'll see that God says, Jesus says, because Jesus is the one speaking in Matthew 13 and in Revelations. He says that only one quarter of the seed that comes from heaven is going to produce fruit. Only one quarter of that which is sown is going to produce the sons of God. Because he said, those who do the will of my father are my family. Only one quarter of everything that gets poured out is going to grow in good seed. And that's going to be his family. And so the very first parable that he warns, as he's saying, there's so much available. But so few are going to allow it to grow. And circumstances are going to kill the seed. Now, <clears throat> I just want you to know that when it talks about the kingdom of heaven, it's not talking about the church. The church is a group, a community of one little group of people. And that group of people have leaders that run it. The kingdom of heaven is where God has opened the portal for the kingdom of heaven to be established. And within the kingdom of heaven, there are many, 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 many different churches. So when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about a different kingdom that he's establishing on earth in which there are families and communities that gather to look after each other, but to live a different way of life. And so everything about these seven parables is about how to live a different way of life and how to establish the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> the next parable from verse 24 says, <clears throat> Then Jesus, they, uh, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field, but while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat. And went away. When the wheat sprouted and, and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, don't you, didn't you sow good seed in the field? Then where did the weeds come from? The, the, uh, some, the, the King James calls them tears. The enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, do you want us to go and pull it out? No, he answered, because while we are pulling out the weeds, you may root up the wheat as well. Let them both grow until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, 
to first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt and then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. Isn't it interesting? <clears throat> Harvesters talk about the harvesting angels. And later on, I think it's in Matthew 25, he actually says that the harvesters are angels. So that's the, the angels that have been sent into the harvest field. Isn't it interesting that he says he's going to gather the weeds first and then the wheat? Well, that blows the whole theory of when trouble comes, we're all going to disappear into the clouds and not have to worry about anything. If the weeds are going to be gathered first and not the wheat, just saying, just a thought. So um, he says um, they will gather the weeds and then they will gather the wheat. Okay, so what does that talk about? Well, it's a seed again. So he's talking about the seed again. And he's saying that the seed grew. But then he said this. He said, while you were sleeping. So there was a time coming that the church was going to be asleep. And in that time, the enemy was going to be sowing a false doctrine. Now that aligns with the scripture in 1 Timothy 4. And in 1 Timothy 4, it says, in the last days. Let me just read it to you that I quoted right. It says, the spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught about demons. So when he said while you were asleep, he was saying there's a time coming when the church is going to be asleep and they're not going to realize that doctrines of demons are going to come in between them and are going to uh, uh, sow a false gospel, a gospel that will bear no fruit because tares and wheat look exactly the same as they're growing. You can't tell which is a tear and which is a wheat, a wheat. And that's why he said to them, don't pull them out yet because you could make a mistake because as they're growing up, they look exactly the same. The one has been sown by doctrines of demons. He says the enemy sowed it. And then in, in, in Timothy, Timothy says doctrines of demons in the last days are going to come in. Why, when is the church asleep in the last days? They're not watching. They're not seeing. Their eyes are closed. They're not awake. And the enemy has come and he has sown um, doctrines of demons with a gospel that doesn't re represent the truth of heaven. And the only way that they're ever going to see what is tears, the gospel of the of demons, deceiving demons, and what is the true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is when they bear fruit. And when that does happen, there's going to be a separation. And so we have to start looking a bit deeper and seeing that this book, Revelations, the end times, and what God is saying about the end times is very, very serious. And we have to look at it very seriously. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, take authority over that in Jesus' name. We have to look at it very seriously. That is why he says seven times in Revelations, twice in this passage, <coughs> okay, I take authority over this cough. In Jesus' name, this is not going to stop the teaching. <clears throat> twice in Matthew he says he who has an ear let him hear my friends there's a gospel being taught in our time that's not the word of God it looks the same growing up but there's going to be no fruit and he warns about it and he says no that my harvesters are going to separate them my harvesters are going to bring the separation so the second one is about understanding doctrines of demons the third one is about the mustard seed so now let's have a quick look at that and that is from verse 31 <clears throat> he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field though it is the smallest of all the seed yet when it grew it became the largest of the garden plants and became a tree so that the birds of the air could come and put perch in the branches now, when else have we heard about a mustard seed? When it talks about faith. Now he's saying that the seed that comes from heaven is a seed of faith. And it's tiny. But when it's planted in the right soil, remember the one quarter soil, the good soil? That seed will grow and grow and grow and become mighty. Now we look at Isaiah 61. And in Isaiah 61, God talks about the fact 
that the Spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me to preach the good news to um, to the poor, to, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to release from prison. And then it goes on to say the day of the Lord, Lord's vengeance is going to be when he takes our ashes and he makes it beauty because his greatest vengeance against the enemy is our lives that have been transformed. And then he goes on to say, and they will be oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. <clears throat> And so God is saying that when he puts the seed of faith into the good soil, it's the tiniest little tiny seed of faith. And in Romans 12, it talks about that he gives us each a measure of faith. But as that faith grows and gets bigger and get bigger and be bigger, those that have allowed the faith to grow in the good soil of their heart will become mighty oaks, mighty trees. And others will find a resting place and a place to come and find a habitation. And it's talking in that parable about faith. Because as long as you've got the faith of a mustard seed. And so he's talking about the trees of righteousness and about allowing the faith seed that has been planted in our hearts to grow mightily. I've told you, you're going to see the comparison between each parable and the letter to the different churches. But you're also going to see it. In, in relationship to where we are at in this time and in this place. Then we see the fourth parable. And this is the yeast of the of the, the yeast that's put into the bread. Let's have a look at that. And it's uh, verse 33. <clears throat> he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast. The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through all the dough. And so now he is talking about how does it grow? My friends, we don't go and try and bombard flour and change it. We don't go and try and change the world by trying to bombard them, by trying to force them, by trying to cause them to to change just because we don't like the way they're doing it we've got to mingle in among them with what we carry and a little bit of what we carry will slowly start working from within and changing their lives and so he's saying this is how you are to change the world you've got to take what's in you and you've got to allow that to start changing the a little bit by little bit as you meet people let your fragrance let who you are let the yeast of who you are the ability to grow let that affect affect them just because you are with them and you know the thing that is so sad for me friends is that so many people complain about where they're working and what they're doing and people are so mean and they can't bear to be there actually God puts us into the places where the things are dark and tough so that the light of who we are can change that environment we're not meant to leave because it's hard we mean to stay there until we brought the change so that everybody can see that heaven has invaded wherever we are. We don't change the world sitting on top of the mountain shouting down. We change the world being the yeast that goes into it and changing it from there. So there he's talking about how it has to grow. The next one, a number five, and that is verse 44. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then to his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. So here we see the picture of finding the treasure, the cost of your salvation, the treasure of what Jesus did for you. And so this is talking about what is the cost? What is the cost? My friends, people say that, um, that grace means there's nothing that you can do. There's no cost. There is cost. There's massive cost. You see, salvation is free, but it'll cost you your life. And what did this man do? He found the treasure and he gave up everything else so that he could have this treasure. And that's what God expects for us to do. He expects for us to give up everything else so that we can have the treasure that he's given us to have. I think people are battling to find me. Let me just quickly see. I think we've just got a message through. Search for 30 minutes to find the site failed. Okie dokie. So sorry about that. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to, let me just answer this. Lisa, I'm so sorry. You were invited on. It was just a case of responding to the invitation. I'll have to get you connected to the next one. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm sorry this isn't being recorded, it, but it is, it is being recorded on, on Facebook, but it's not being recorded on Audible. Sorry about that. I just can't record both at the same time. So 
we'll have to make it work better. Anyway, so here we see he's talking about what is the cost, friends. The cost is that when you find the kingdom of heaven, give up everything else. It has to become your all. It's got to become your focus. So that parable, parable number five, is about what it's going to cost to follow Jesus. Parable number six is the one of finding the pearl of great price. <clears throat> Again, the kingdom of heaven, verse 45, is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of the great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. Now, what is it about pearls that are precious? The first thing I want you to know, it's the only precious thing that is found within a living creature. So when God talks about a pearl, he talks about what's happening in your heart. You are the pearl. It's your testimony. You see, a pearl is formed when what is irritation and dirt inside um, the shell, and then the nacre forms around it and around it and around it, protecting the irritation from the oyster. And eventually it becomes smooth and beautiful and it becomes a pearl. Now that's exactly what God does. He takes our mess and he covers it and he makes it absolutely beautiful until we become treasure. So the greatest treasure and the pearl is your testimony. That is why you don't throw your pearls before swine. You don't throw what costs you to become perfect, to become changed, to become transformed. You don't take that and throw it before people that refuse to change. You don't throw your pearls before swine. And the pearl talks about your testimony. It talks about what God has done in your life. It's the cost of your life being transformed. And you need to make every effort to say, God, my focus is in you transforming me into that pearl. That is why he said he gave up everything so that he could have that pearl. We've got to see what God is preparing us for. We've got to see our created destiny. We've got to see what God, what we look like to God in the fullness of our created destiny. That's what we've got to see, and we don't stop until we get there. So at the one, the treasure is your cost. Get rid of everything else so that you can follow him. And the next is make the transformation, make the process, the sanctification, the glorification. Let that be the most important thing. Getting back into his glory, to your created state. Let that be the most important thing that you go for and you strive for. And let that be what your heart is desiring for. And then, so that's number six. And then number seven, and if you look at uh, verse 47, and remember they relate to different churches. So number seven relates to the Laodicea church. And the Laodicea church is the season that we are in right now. <clears throat> and I'm going to look at verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Remember he said to Paul, Peter, Paul, to the disciples, I'm going to make you fishers of men. So whenever he talks about fishing and nets, he's talking about the harvest coming in. He's talking about evangelism. He's talking about people getting saved. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up into the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad fish away. <clears throat> Not all the fish in the net are going to be with the king. Not everybody that calls himself church is going to land up going to the Father. He's going to separate. There's a time of separating. There's a time of taking that which is good and that which isn't good and separating it. One lot is going to be kept and the others is going to be thrown back. So the seventh parable is the parable of separating of the net. So we see the first one about the good soil, that only a quarter of that those who receive are going to actually be following Jesus. And that circumstances and um, trials are going to cause people to lose their way. The next one is going to, it's talking about the doctrines of demons that have been released into the end time church when people are sleeping. And to be careful and to be aware and to see. The next one is talking about faith that no matter how how small that faith is, that that person that, that absolutely walk, works on the faith of God will become a mighty righteous um, a tree, an oak, a tree of righteousness where others will find themselves resting. The next one talks about how do we change the world? A little bit of he's going into situations that are bad and changing them. That's how we change the world. The next one talks about the cost. It's going to cost you everything. This great treasure that we've been given called Kingdom of heaven, a different way of living, means we've got to let go completely of what was important in the world to be able to take a hold of that which is important in the kingdom. 
The next one's talking about the pearl of great price. Being prepared to lay down everything so that you can come into the fullness of your predestined created state. What God planned for you originally. And then the seventh one talks about the time coming where there's going to be a separating of good fish and bad fish. So the only nine times that we hear the, 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 the saying that says, he who has an ear, let him hear. This is really, really important. I want you to listen to this. Seven times when Jesus talks to the, the letters in the seven churches and twice in that passage of Matthew 13, when he, Jesus tells us what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. So both those passages are extremely important and Jesus puts much focus on it. The chart of the sevens looks something like this. So you will find it on page 146 and then we're going to go back and look at it again later on. But that's where I want you to just start looking when you've got a moment and you'll start looking at the unpacking of that. Okay. <clears throat> We've seen what John is. Now let's start reading a little bit on Revelations. So Revelations 1, and we're going to be looking from chapter 1 to chapter 3 and look at it in little bite-sized pieces. All right, now that I've finished that, let me quickly make sure there's no one that's got a question about the, the parables about the kingdom. Let's quickly see. <clears throat> Anyone got a question on the comments here? All right, no questions. Shame. The only problem is that people still haven't got their notes. Anyone got a question? No, I don't see any questions coming up. Good, I'll carry on. Revelations 1, verse 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to everything he saw. That is the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and take to heart what is written because the time is near. So this book is the only book that was written specifically for the end time church. Everything that was written before that was written for the church that Jesus established with the 12 disciples. But this book was written for us, and that is why we need to know what is coming. Okay, when it said he, he, um, he made it known by his angel, that word angel, if you look at the word angel, it means messenger, it means pastor, and it means an angel. So it is a, a spiritual messenger, it is also a physical person, and it's an angel. So we see that often in the Bible where it talks about pastor, it also uses the word angel, or angel, it uses the word pastor. And that is because demonic spirits always need people to manifest through, and angels will always manifest through people. And so as we look at it later on, and it talks about the angels and the, and the, um, the, the pastors that are positioned, there's an angel... That goes with every, the Bible says in Hebrews 1 verse 14 that angels are sent to serve those that are being saved. So everything we do have angels attached to them. So these are angels sent to do specific things to help the pastors of the seven churches. And this angel that came to bring this message, the messenger that came to bring this message to Paul, to John, was actually Jesus himself. <clears throat> Let's carry on. Revelations 1. Verse 4 to 20. John, to the seven letters, which means the whole church in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from, who he, from him who was and who is and who is to come. Now, it's really important to see who this letter is from. Grace and peace to you from him who was and is and is to come. That is the Father himself. So the message is coming straight from the Father himself. From the seven spirits before the throne, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. So this book, Revelations, and the message of Revelations, comes from the fullness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together. It is a message from the Trinity. It is incredibly important that we look at it. Now, 
What are the seven spirits before the throne? Well, if we look at um, Isaiah 11 verse 2, we'll see that it's the spirit of the Lord. And the spirit of the Lord is the part of the Holy Spirit that allows us to prophesy and to be transported. So you'll see that every time that they prophesied in the Old Testament, <clears throat> or where they were transported, it said the spirit of the Lord was there and then suddenly they moved. The spirit of the Lord was there and then they prophesied. So the aspect of the spirit of the Lord, which is part of that Holy Spirit, the fullness of him, is what allowed the prophecy and the and the tra uh, transporting. That is why even today, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. Then the spirit of wisdom. So the, the first one is the spirit of the Lord. The second one is the spirit of wisdom. The third is the spirit of understanding. Being able to understand things. We don't just want wisdom, but we also need to know what to understand. And that is why even today in what we're facing and what we're going through, we have to understand the times. The Bible says that God tells the sons of Ishaka the, the times to understand what's going, because we can only find solutions when you understand what's going on. So there's a Holy Spirit aspect to understand. There's a spirit of counsel, which means that we are able to counsel people and speak into their lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit of might, not by your might or power, but by his spirit, spirit of might. There's a spirit of knowledge. That is revelational knowledge. That is knowing things from heaven's perspective. That is being able to have knowledge of greater things that you could only ever know by us being in the presence of God into situations to know exactly what to do. And then there's a the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Remember, everything that comes in sevens and comes in the order of sevens has power. And they all align with each other. So it's important that we look at that. And we look at that again a little later on. So this letter comes from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To him who loves and was has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Now, I love that. Because, you know, we've got free choice in everything. And yet when you look at Psalm 23, it said he makes us lie down in green pastures. So there is an aspect of Jesus that says, I'm going to make you lie down. You need to rest now. And so there are many times in our life where we get made to enter into rest because it's the best thing for us. And we don't understand it at the time. Things happen in our life. We get fired or we have a coronavirus or we, um, we, we suddenly... Something happens where you are forced into a state of rest and it's because he wants your attention and he wants you to spend time with him. So there are times that he makes us lie down in green pastures. And here it says he makes us to be a kingdom of priests. Now, why does he do that or how does he do that? Well, if you look at the parables and you see that only a quarter of those that receive the seed are going to bring forth much fruit. And you see the fact that he says, guys, give up everything so that you can have more of me. And the more that you give up and the more that you lay down and the more that you hunger and the more that you thirst, in that process, you get transformed. And then you become manifesting the authority of heaven because you start looking, seeing, smelling and living and walking in the authority and the power of Jesus himself. And therefore, you become a king, a king from a different kingdom, a king from the kingdom of heaven that walks in authority on earth to be able to establish the authority of heaven on earth. And being a priest is our love affair with Jesus. Priest is serving Jesus. It's, it's, we priest him when we come before him. We make sacrifices to him. We love him and we serve him. So the more that we grow, the more that we allow him to lead us, the more he changes us and he makes us to become people of authority and people who know how to love him. Now, you know, this year, God said the time of being faithful with small things are over. And it is the time of being the ruler over much. He's actually said, church, grow up. Because it's time to become the authority, the kings that I've called you to be. It's time to rise up in your kingship and establish what I have called you to be to establish. You can no longer hide behind the fact that you're immature because the time has come and I am making you grow up. And that's the whole Galatians 4 passage where it says that a child is still being looked after by servants and governors and has known, even though he owns everything, he's got no authority. But the time comes that you rise up in your sonship and you say, this is my inheritance and you are now serving me. 
And that's what he's calling us to do. He's calling us to rise up in the kingship of who we are in this place and become who he's called us to be. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit brought this message. And he says, I'm making you to become kings and priests that know how to love me, worship me, and walk in the authority. It goes on to say, to be glory and power forever and ever. So to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the people of the earth will mourn before him. So shall it be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, said the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So he makes a statement right from the beginning when he speaks to John. And he says, John, this is a message from the fullness of the Godhead, from the fullness of the authority. It is really important you need to listen to it. And he talks about the fact that he has come here to give a message to the end time of what's to come. And he is omnipotent and omnipresent. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Then we go on to verse 9. And it says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now here John does not say, I, Apostle John. He says, I, John, a brother and a companion in suffering. He's writing to the church of the time, and he's saying, I'm a companion in suffering. We've all been suffering. It's been hard for all of us. Well, he's just got out of a pot of boiling oil. That is incredible suffering. And he's now on the Isle of Patmos. We don't know if he's even healed on the Isle of Patmos, but that's where he was. And he says, a companion in the suffering and kingdom. I'm a companion in the kingdom and I'm a companion in the suffering and with patient endurance. Now, I've unpacked that a little bit more in your manual and you can carry on and read a bit more about that. But suffering is part of the journey, friends. I want to tell you now, suffering is part of the journey. If you look at Acts 14 verse 22, it says, strengthening the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to repeat that again. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Hardships is part of our journey. We must go through many. <coughs> Matthew 5, 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Matthew 5 verse 10. We are living in a day where there's been doctrines of demons, where there's been a gospel that's been preached that doesn't align with the word and doesn't align with the truth. And the day of separation is coming. But friends, what gospel do you believe? And what truth do you believe? Do you know that hardship is part of the journey and suffering is part of the journey? And John says, I'm a companion in suffering and kingdom with patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word and because of the testimony of Jesus. I want to tell you this, friends. If your word is, if your life is tough, the result and the solution is not to give up. The solution and the, and the, and the, and the result is to patiently endure until the breakthrough comes. Don't change jobs because it's tough. Don't look for an easy way out. Don't believe the gospel that says serving Jesus is all about grace and it costs you nothing. It's nonsense. It's a doctrine of demons. I want to tell you now that those who endure to the end will be saved. Everything about the letters to this, the churches is all about enduring. Those who overcome, those who overcome, those who overcome. Now, why would there be such a lot of warning for overcoming if there wasn't something to overcome? Friends, there is a huge, big journey of overcoming. And I want to tell you this. If you haven't had hard times yet, they're coming. Do you honestly believe that God would have some Christians go through such terrible times and others sail through with a greasy grace message that say, love Jesus, that's all, and live like hell, it's fine. Doctrines of demons have been released. 2 Timothy says, if you endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. 
There are many more, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. I just wanted to touch on that. Verse 10 says, Revelations verse 10. <clears throat> On the day of the Lord, I was in the spirit. So he was worshiping. He'd entered into the third heaven. He was in the spirit. He was having a heaven encounter. And I heard a voice behind, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Tyre, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The order is very, very important. Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. So he was saying, I want you to record everything you see and I want you to send it to all the churches. That is still the call that God has got on the prophetic today, friends. He still says, record what you see and send it. Record what you see and tell people. Now, there are times when he tells you not to tell people. But if he's given you something that's got to go to the church, you've got to send it. They don't have to receive it. That's not your problem. But you've got to send it. And then he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, now I want to just go back. I explained to you who John was for a very particular reason. John was the disciple that lay on Jesus' chest. John was Jesus' cousin. John saw Jesus transformed. John saw Jesus die. John saw Jesus resurrected. John grew up with Jesus. John knew Jesus from when he was born. He was younger than Jesus. He was the youngest of all of them. So he knew Jesus intimately at least 81 times. In the New Testament, Jesus himself quotes and says, I am the Son of Man. He talks about him as himself as the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of Man. 81 times that Jesus says it and it's recorded in the, um, in the New Testament. Why am I telling you that? Because if, if you know somebody that well and suddenly they're standing behind you, you're not surprised. He saw the resurrected. He saw the, the Jesus that, um, tr that was transformed with Elijah and with Moses. And yet in this moment, when he saw him in his glorified state, he fell on his face before him. I want to tell you, friends, the glorified Jesus, no one can stand in his presence without being absolutely in awe at who he is because he's amazing. <clears throat> I turned and I saw the seven go oh yeah. I turned to see to around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He could see he was he resembled the Son of Man. He resembled who he who he'd always been. He was dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The sash around the chest always talks about the breastplate. The breastplate of righteousness is what's around our chest. It's a golden sash. Gold is the purity. That which has been made pure is always gold. So here's the purity, the fullness of righteousness being manifest. And you can read about that in, um, in, in uh, Proverbs and in Ephesians. <clears throat> it said in verse 14, His head and hair was white like wool, as white as snow. White talks about, snow always talks about purity, so his hair was white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. The Bible talks about the Father being the consuming fire, and his eyes were so alive, they were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace. <clears throat> you know, I had a vision the other night. <coughs> And I saw the sons of God rising up. And um, and when I saw the sons of God rising up, I saw that they had the, a heart like the lion of the tribe of Judah. They were bold and very courageous. And then I saw that they had eyes of fire, just like Jesus. And the kings, the sons of God that are rising up in this time have got the eyes of fire, just like Jesus. And they've got the heart of the boldness of the authority of heaven, the line of the tribe of Judah in their hearts. But then I saw that their mouths were anointed with the love of the father. And I, and I, and I saw this picture of this paralyzing, terrifying sons of God rising up 
against the forces of darkness. And yet when they touched people, there was nothing but love and compassion and care that came out of their mouths and out of their bodies as they reached them and touched them and loved on them. And so the eyes that Jesus had, the eyes of fire, are the eyes that the sons of God that are rising up are going to have too. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. John 7 says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living waters will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit. So the Spirit of God was flowing out of him like rushing waters. So, I mean, no wonder. He was, he was just glorious. His face was a glow. Verse 16 says, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth, came a sharp, double-edged sword. Hebrews tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. So it's the word that came straight out of his mouth that was flowing out. And verse 16 carries on to say, his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm really battling with my throat tonight, but guys, it's not going to get it's not going to get the better of me. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, Now, the moment that he saw Jesus, <clears throat> he was just slain in the spirit. It was all just too much for him. He's been in the spirit. He's been worshiping. He's been in this intimate place on, on the Isle of Patmos. And the next minute that Jesus comes and manifests in his glorified state. And it's just so overwhelming that John is slain in his spirit. And everything about Proverbs, Revelations, is a prophetic book, friends. And everything has symbolism. So when he said he touched him with his right hand, everything that's on the right-hand side of God is always right. Everything that's on the left is always wrong. So the light is always good and the other one is always bad. So when he touched him on his, with his right hand, he's saying that he's touching him with joy, with gladness, that he's pleased with him, that it is good. Touches him with his right hand. Verse 19 says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mysteries of the seven stars that you've seen in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So it's the angel that's sent to serve the leaders of that church. So you've seen them. They come from my hand. I'm holding them. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. There is a lampstand that puts, that's put in place so that the church can shine. Remember, the, we've been called to arise and shine. The light is called to shine out of us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He then went to the disciples and he said, you are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. We are the light that has to shine. And he puts a lampstand there for the light to stand on, to be able to shine. And you don't take a light and hide it under a bushel. You shine it for the world to see. So he's saying, in my right hand are the angels that are there for the pastors and for the leaders, and are the lampstands, the light, the stands, that those that are the light in those fellowships will shine brightly on and draw people onto them. Symbolism, a seven, seven, seven. It's the completeness and it's seven. So the lamp, is the, the lamp is also the word of God and the spirit of God that is within us. The Bible says in Proverbs, the lamp of the Lord searches the spirit of man and it searches his innermost being. Proverbs 6 says, um, for these commands are a lamp, these teachings are a light, and the corrections of the discipline are the way of life. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so the word of God is a lamp that he puts inside of us. So we become the lamp. Remember that mustard seed, we become the lamp. And the lamp stand is that place to be able to shine, to stand. And while there's a lamp stand in the church, it means that the, the kabod presence of God is still there. He does lift lamp stands and he does lift presence. And then you've just got a lot of religious people but he isn't there. <clears throat> so it's representing the church 
It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen on you. See the darkness. We've heard that quoted so many times because, friends, the glory of God could only rise on people once the Spirit of God had arrived. That Isaiah 60 is talking about the end time church. And it's our scripture. And we're the ones that have to arise and to shine. It's incredibly important that we do. So we see that he brought and he came to show John, John, I have come in my glorified state. I carry the lampstands, which entitles the churches in those cities to be able to draw people to me. Where the light, the lamp, my word, and you are the light can rest into those lampstands. So it's almost like seeing the, the menorah with all the candles in it. And then he said, and the angels in my right hand, and the angel that's come to serve those that are running the churches, I've brought them to be able to um, do what I've commissioned them to do. And our job is to come into agreement with what the angels have come to do. That's what God has called us to do. Okay. Now, um, there's a bit more scripture there, but I'm looking at the time, and I'm not going to unpack that now. But what I am going to do is I'm going to end with this. The seven letters to the seven churches are to seven specific churches in seven specific church orders. Now, they did pass letters to each other, but they were specifically to those churches. The next thing is that they were to all the churches. Because they then took those letters and passed it around to the other churches, all of them were able to draw from these churches and what these churches had to say. They were also for seven specific church eras called the church age, which started with a church that Jesus planted and ended with a church that was there just before he came back. The Laodicea, the last season church, which is us. We are the end time church. And it's also to the end time church in full. Because all seven of those churches are manifesting today. So we see the church eras. We see that they were specific churches then. We see it was to all the churches then. And we also see that in this time, even though we are the last end time church, there are seven types of churches that are manifesting today. And so the relevance of the whole world is to everybody today to see where do you fit in? What have you fallen under? And what do you need to deal with so that you can live in freedom? So we see the, the power, the prophetic power behind this letter. And we also see the incredible prophetic power of the sevens, seven spirits before the throne, the seven parables, the seven letters to the seven churches, the seven angels that have been released, the seven lampstands that, ha that are carrying the seven lights. And so everything is in seven, which means seven individual things making up the complete, the whole, and the, the fullness of what God is saying at that time. And then the order is very important. And we see that the first letter was written to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was established while in the time of Jesus. Paul went there for a few years, three years and four, I think. And he, he worked very hard in Ephesus and he established an incredible church in Ephesus. And then John ended up being the, the apostle, being the bishop of Ephesus until his death, which ended the church era of Ephesus. So next week, we're going to be talking about Ephesus. I mean, on Thursday night, we're going to be talking about that. I would really like you to read the book that was written specifically to that church, because it really is a very powerful book. And I'm going to be talking about that on Thursday night. This has just been an introductory a message. I hope it's given you a little bit more insight into um, how the book unpacks itself. And I'm trusting that it's given you a little bit of a hunger to want to know more and to be able to, um, to, to find more information as you go along. I'm really asking you to ask God that anything that you've believed as a neural path that might be touched, that he will show you what where you need to make adjustments because i had to make big adjustments as i was researching this and i want to say to you friends the chances are so will you i also want to say to you this i'm not teaching this as a very heavy intellectual theological religious teaching i'm teaching it more as a bit of a history as a bit of prophetic unpacking and a bit of revealing things to you for you to see things from a different perspective i hope this is helpful and i trust that I've stirred an interest in you to want to know more. Okay, I'm quickly going to see if there's anybody with a question. If you've got a question, send it on, on WhatsApp, seven letters now. And um, otherwise, if you can put a, a, a thing up on the, on, the, 
on the um yeah on the comments here i'll quickly see if i can answer the question otherwise if you haven't got bless you so abundantly i know that some people have battled but we will get them connected we'll make sure that it's that's in and i'm trusting that this is a forum that will work for everybody and i'm trusting that it's going to be easier on thursday night when we have our second session bless you abundantly you can go back and listen to it it's on facebook love you guys so much i'm missing you so much just seeing your names there has stirred up such joy in my heart and love you all very very much good night guys